Okay, so we've recently had a general election in the United Kingdom, which resulted in Boris Johnson gaining a, ver a very substantial majority over the opposition Labour Party. I thought in this post we would take a look at how elections were conducted back in the late 18th century, and as they were experienced through the eyes of Joseph Ritson. Joseph Ritson was born in Stockton on Tees in 1752 and was a conveyancer by trade. He'd moved to London in his early 20s and served a brief spell as an apprentice in the conveyancing firm of Messrs Masterman and Lloyd. He'd also inherited some property in Stockton from an uncle who passed away in the 1780s. This was an important step to Ritson's becoming a true 18th century gentleman because it gave him the right to vote. For voting rights were restricted to people who owned property, that's freehold property, that was worth over 40 shillings or two pounds. The exact value of Ritson's property remains unknown, but as he could vote, it must have been worth over this amount. He never, made, he never actually made any money from his properties, however. Ritson's tenants rarely paid up on time, and some of the cottages on his estates were falling into disrepair. Ritson himself was hardly rich, earning but £150 per year, and he was certainly not a member of the aristocratic and mercantile elite, which dominated the electoral franchise at this point. The fact that Ritson could vote, however, highlights one of the many absurdities of the 18th century electoral system. Although it is, with some justification, assumed by many that only rich people could vote, and that governments were elected by a, na a narrow number of electors, there were also situations where, as in Ritson's case, a man could be relatively poor, earn little from his property, and in spite of this still have the right to vote because he owned property that was worth over 40 shillings. Now, Ritson was fairly quiet about politics in the years following the American War of Independence, but after around 1784, we do start to get a little bit of political commentary from him. Now, in the 18th century, governments could sit for a maximum total of seven years, thanks to the Centennial Act, passed in 1716, although governments often fell before this term limit, however. There had been a general election in the wake of the American War in 1784, with King George III having engineered an election to get rid of the Prime Minister Lord North, who lost, quote-unquote, the American colonies. This resulted in a victory for William Pitt the Younger, who won a wafer-thin majority on 280 seats. There were only at this time 558 seats in total in the Commons. Later in 1790, Pitt then called an election again, which resulted in him winning what we would call now a landslide victory of 380 seats. Impressive for either now or then. In his letters, Ritson dis expressed how disgusted he was with the 18th century political system when he commented upon this general election of 1790, saying that he could witness nothing but bribery and perjury, which is the quote we saw at the beginning. But why would Ritson say this? Well, let's have a closer look at the voting practices in the 18th century. First of all, in Britain at this top point, there were two main political parties. There was the Tories, led by William Pitt, often called Pittites, and the Whigs. Now, the Tories were known as the King's Friend. They believed in the need for strong powers for the monarchy, a strong Church of England, and wanted to maintain the preeminent social position and rights of the landowners. The Whigs stressed the need for very limited powers for the monarchy. They were tolerant of dissenters, those were Protestants who were not part of the Anglican Church, and they were the party that was most friendly to business and trade. We might say the Whigs were the party of the middle classes. That being said, 
We should not make the mistake of thinking that they were a modern political party by any stretch. The electorate was very small and these parties did not publish manifestos as they do today. There was no need, after all, when the vast majority of the population could not vote. But instead, the, the party system, such as it existed at this point, was simply a system of loose alliances between MPs who found that they had common interests with each other. Ritson enthusiastically endorsed the Whig statesman, Charles James Fox, the leader of the Whigs. His party had been in opposition since 1784. On one occasion, Joseph Ritson exclaimed in his letters, Fox and liberty forever. And elsewhere, Ritson said, if Charles Fox don't take the helm, then there would be immediate ruin. Now, general elections in the 18th century usually lasted slightly over a month, as each constituency polled on a different day, and it took a while for all the, res the results from all over the country to travel to London and actually be counted. The general election of 1790 took place between 16th of June and 28th of July. But Ritson was not able to vote in London itself, in spite of the fact that he was now resident there. Instead, if he wanted to vote, he had to travel all the way back to Stockton, for that is where he was registered as an elector, because his property was situated there. There were two seats up for grabs in Ritson's home constituency of Durham County. Now, one of Ritson's friends, named Mr Roundtree, attempted to convince Ritson to make the journey from London back up to Stockton and cast a vote for the Whig candidate, Captain Ralph Milbank. Ritson thought this was rather cheeky. Dear Roundtree, I this morning received your favour of the 20th. How can it have happened that you should expect me down? I certainly had no intention. It would have been highly inconvenient, if not altogether improper, to have set out immediately on the receipt of your letter. I am nevertheless perfectly desirous, if a single vote can be of consequence, to give mine to Mr Milbank, and for that purpose I am ready to sacrifice my convenience to my inclination, and come down as a freeholder in the same way that a gentleman does, though I shall certainly make it a point to return the moment I have polled. No one, I should think, could expect me to make such a journey at my own expense, nor, if I do come down, shall anything I hear say be construed to prevent me from splitting my vote, if I see occasion, for it in favour of Sir John Eden. As a property owner, then, Ritson was inclined to do his civic duty, so to speak, and return to Stockton and cast a vote. But Ritson expected payment for his services as a voter, and this was the usual practice. Candidates would canvass voters before an election to see if they could count on their support. If a voter had to travel a long way to cast his vote, he also expected to be paid expenses. And you can see here in the illustration from the late 18th century, titled An Election Entertainment, a prospective MP is throwing a party for his would-be electors. And this is why Ritson's letter to his friend Roundtree is very standoffish. Ritson was a property-owning gentleman, even if he wasn't rich, and it was barefaced cheek for anyone, even those with whom he was friends, to ask him to make a journey and spend his own money simply to cast a vote. Ritson may have disapproved of the bribery and perjury, which he said flourished at election times, but he expected to receive expenses for his troubles were he to vote in person. But why wouldn't Ritson vote for Milbank anyway? For he was the Whig candidate, standing for the party that Ritson had confessed support for. Well, Ritson would use his vote as he saw fit. He would not be railroaded solely into voting for Milbank, but might split his vote and lend his support both to Milbank and the other Whig candidate, John Eden. 
This perhaps requires some explanation. In general elections, each constituency generally sent two members to the House of Commons, and when a person gained voting rights as a result of meeting the 18th century property qualification, he gained the right to actually cast two votes. Under this system, if a voter wanted to support only one party, he could opt for, he could opt for a straight party vote and cast his votes for the two candidates who had been nominated by a single party. If a voter could not decide which party to vote for, he might even cast one vote for a Tory candidate and one vote for a Whig candidate. If you think this was all a bit messy, well, it was. Now, ultimately, Captain Milbank won his seat with a comfortable majority. Ritson's other candidate, Sir John Eden, was not so lucky in the end because he lost his seat to Sir Roland Burton, a Tory landholder who held his seat until 1806. This was probably a good thing anyway. Eden could rarely be bothered to actually make the trip down to London, sit in Parliament and represent his electors, because he was more fond of, fond of hunting. So even in the rotten, quote-unquote, Parliament of the 18th century, it is unsurprising that voters eventually opted for someone else. The coming of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars between 1793 and 1815 saw the voices of the increasingly influential middle classes combine with the working classes to call for reform of the political system and the extension of the franchise. And you can see the bottom illustration here on this slide, the Peterloo Massacre, one major event in that fight for the extension of the franchise. Partial reform of the system came in 1832 with the passage of the Great Reform Act. This act extended voting rights to people with the following property qualifications. Those who owned freehold land worth over 40 shillings, those who owned copyhold property worth over 10 pounds, and male householders who paid rent on any property worth over 50 pounds per year. This measure effectively excluded the working classes from voting, and it was not until 1867 that the vote was given to some working class male householders and it was not until 1918 that the vote was given to all men and some women. Thank you for listening.